Thank you, Don, and good evening, everyone. Before I start, I uh, just noted a person that sat down in the back of this room that I want to have take a bow. He happens to be the son of a very close friend of mine who lives in Doylestown, Captain Sidney A. Salomon of B Company of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, one of the highly decorated uh, Rangers of World War II. He would be here tonight, but he's pushing for uh, 85, and you know, he's in battle in Topeka, Kansas tonight, racing in skulls, a rower, for the, ma for the Masters Championship of the United States. He's been national champion and international champion, and it's up again, and that's where he is tonight, or he'll be here. But his son is here. Henry, would you stand up and give a bow? <laughs> his dad and his boys of C Company on D-Day were at Point Della Per Se, where they took the high guns out of there, too, that were missed by the bombers. However, uh, I will refer to him later as we get to that part of our talk. I'm here to talk to you about World War II, the good guys against the bad guys. Can you hear me in the back? How can you hear me? Is that okay? He's waving his hand. Hello. I mean, is it okay? Yeah, you can hear. Go ahead. Is that what he's saying? Yeah. Good. But anyway, it was the good guys against the bad guys. In any event, Don, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, this was the era of your parents and grandparents. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I look out at you and I see so many baby boomers. I, I expected an older group. So you're going to have to adjust for comments I make because I thought there'd be an older crowd here. Yes, I'm a grandparent, too, also a great-grandparent. Your parents or grandparents, in their youth, many years ago, made a great effort to make their generation awesome. And you, they wanted to make our world a safer place to live, preserve freedom, and they did. I'm now speaking of your grandparents and your parents. Matters not if they served in uniform or worked in a defense factory. Whatever your grandparents or parents contributed, they helped keep our democracy running successful and produce machinery and the like than any other allied nation in World War II. History has shown that patriotic Americans are and were extremely hard workers. In 1939, Hitler and his German military machine started World War II and began their reign of terror in Europe to conquer the world and enslave its people. December 7, 1941, the Japanese, an ally of Germany and Italy, our enemies, attacked Pearl Harbor. America entered World War II shortly thereafter to defend itself. At, that, at this point in time, our army consisted of 175,000 men which meant it ranked 16th in the world, right behind Romania, hardly enough to defend ourselves. Our tank and air power was nil. Our Navy consisted of some battleships, a few destroyers, not much else. The Navy had no landing craft. Organized labor, management, and government were all but at war with each other in the United States at the time. The American industrial plant, because of the lack of demand, was producing less than one half capacity. We were coming out of the greatest depression in history, a time for readjustment in many areas of life in the USA. The attack on Pearl Harbor brought about a miracle. General Eisenhower called it a, quote, fury of an aroused nation, revealing an awesome power of voluntary teamwork and patriotism. America and Russia contributed the most members of the military forces at peak approximately 12 and a half million each, followed by Germany with 10 million uh, in their um, armed forces. The nearest ally of ours in number of military personnel was Great Britain with 4,683,000. Here we are now in 1998. Russia has become insolvent, or almost, and communism has failed. Our Cold War 
with them ended several years ago, 1991, our America became the most powerful nation on earth. Your grandparents and parents or parents and their generation saved the world as a result of winning World War II. So said President Clinton at the celebration of the 50th anniversary of D-Day. Whatever was their sacrifice or contribution, their extremely hard work and dedication brought victory and an end to World War II. You should occasionally let your grandparents or parents know how proud you are of them. One way would be to let them know you know something about World War II and that you're still interested in their part in the suffering they faced in the Great Depression and World War II. They proved they were made of the right stuff. For example, it was and is the biggest war in history. It cost the United States $288 billion. It cost Germany $212, and I'm going to round these figures off, $212 billion, more than twice as much as any other country. Total Americans killed in action in World War II, 292,000, wounded 671,000. Now I'm running through these figures because there are very young people in this room who haven't a foggiest idea how big and mind-boggling World War II was. So therefore, bear with me, you older baby boomers, estimated, <laughs> estimated international figures are killed in action 14,900, 14,900,000. Military wounded, and this is all military in World War II, 25 million wounded. Now you think about that when you think about uh, Korea, Vietnam, and every conflict and confrontation we've had since World War II. Average enlisted man's pay was $71 per month. Average officer's pay was $203 per month. I'm rounding them off. 105 Americans became POWs. I think there's better than 20,000 I'm aware of that still haven't been found. The bottom line regarding estimated total economic cost to those involved was at least $1,600,000. It is estimated that the indirect cost of World War I approximated $31 billion. Now, a profile of our armed forces in World War II was approximately, made up of volunteers, 38%, draftees, 62%, rejected, 6,400,000. Average time served by a vet was 33 months in service. 73% of our troops served overseas. 38% of the enlisted personnel were non-combatants. Our America produced the tools of war in unbelievable numbers for two and a half years, from December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day onward. Your parents or grandparents put forth a tremendous effort in creating America's finest fighting force that on D-Day, June 6, 1944, landed in Normandy, France, breaking through Hitler's strongest coastal defense, the Atlantic Wall, the beginning of the end of Hitler and his troops. The second miracle was the creation of the U.S. military force of approximately 12 and a half million men and women. <coughs> Excuse me. Remember, on Pearl Harbor Day, our army was only 175 men, 175,000 men. Incidentally, you ladies should be very proud. There were 400,000 plus women, volunteers, that were never drafted and did serve very honorably in helping to win World War II. Actually, the Marine Corps at the same time had about 490,000. They were in the same ballpark, plus. Also volunteers, they did well too. All Americans contributed in some way to the best of their ability, all patriots to be proud of ever after. You should be proud to be related to them. Now I want to tell you about the history of the Rangers of Part II. Is there anybody in here who doesn't know what a ranger is? I can, well, there, <laughs> all right. I got some really juniors over here that don't. Well, I'm going to help you understand because I've had to wrestle with this for over a half a century at cocktail parties and other places I've been. If the subject of World War II come up and the older guys are around, I'm one of them. Uh, someone will say, "Were you in service?" And I say, "Yes." What unit? Rangers? What are they? And, and I 
make some smart remark, and, but somehow I'm trying to get across to those who may not know what rangers are and what they do. I will tell you how it all started. Back in the French and Indian War, you may have heard about the Roger Rangers. The Revolutionary War, the Civil War, they all had rangers. We didn't have any in World War I. Reactivated in World War II, that's when we have our present day World War II rangers. Then we had rangers in Korea, Vietnam, Panama, Grenada, Somalia, Desert Storm, we've had our rangers. Years ago, the range riders, forward observers, those who rode out ahead of the pioneers as they moved westward, were sometimes called rangers in those days. Though we were to be trained by and fight as commandos, General Eisenhower and General Truscott, who organized it, chose to name us the U.S. Army Rangers. They did not want us to be called commandos like other armies in the, in the, in the international circle of the military. World War II Rangers were activated early in 1942, as this gentleman inquired about, in Achnacarry, Scotland. That's the first ranger battalion commanded by Colonel Darby. They were the first rangers to fight on foreign soil and the first to die at Dieppe, France, August of 42, World War II. They were, there were six ranger battalions in World War II, five in the ETO, and as most of you know, that's the European Theater of Operation, and one in the Pacific Theater of Operation. 500 rangers in each battalion, 3,000 men originally, plus many replacements. Various ranger battalions participated in seven invasions. North Africa, Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio, that would have been the first, third, and fourth ranger battalions. Normandy, that would be the second and fifth European theater. And Lady and Luzon in the Philippines, that would have been our sixth ranger battalion. They also took part in at least 25 major battles, the biggest and most important in World War II. They conducted innumerable raids, combat patrols, and firefights with the enemy, and just as many recon patrols. As a result, the Rangers suffered one of the highest casualty rates in World War II. No other combat unit had a more enviable combat record. They had won seven presidential units, several, or seven. They had won seven presidential unit citations for excellence and were decorated by several foreign countries. Our second Ranger Battalion was so honored for being the first outfit to accomplish our D-Day mission. The highest Medal of Valor awarded a Ranger in World War II was the Distinguished Service Cross, the ESC. America's second highest combat award. No Ranger was awarded a Medal of Honor in World War II. They have since World War II received a Medal of Honor in Korea and Vietnam. Ranger qualifications. They consist of only volunteers. They were given the toughest physical, psychological, and mental testing available at the time. Their, IQ, their IQ should be in the range of 110 to 120 or better to be eligible for officer's candidate school. They had to possess strong leadership qualifications. They're all potential leaders and the highest integrity determined and of strong and good moral character. Their civilian records should show that they had been law-abiding citizens, good citizens, men of good judgment, plenty of good common sense, resourceful and have the desire to excel and to accomplish all missions, however dangerous. The Ranger's Creed states he must strive at all times to keep mentally alert, physically strong, and morally straight. Their original motto was, quote, unquote, be the best of the best. In World War II, General Cota, who was the executive officer of the 29th Division, as you'll recall, and without me going into the chaos and problems on bloody Omaha Beach, he was strutting around. I shouldn't use that word, strutting, but I respectfully do. With his 45 standing up, trying to move troops. And then in came our 5th Ranger Battalion. He said, who are you? And we said, Rangers. And he said, well, if you're Rangers, lead the way. And they did. They led many of the troops successfully off Omaha Beach and drove the Germans inland. Rangers lead the way became and continues to be our present motto. We were supposed to be the counterpart of the best of the commandos of other nations. We believe we were the best. You know, we're a little conceited, you might add. Our present day Rangers have continued on in their efforts to be even better. We're proud of them and support their efforts wholeheartedly. Now our training. Our second Ranger Battalion examined and tested over 2,000 volunteers. The cream of the crop, it was said. 
before selecting and organizing our final 500 men that made up our battalion for combat. 68 men per company plus specialists in headquarters company. We were activated on April 1, 1943 at Camp Forest, Tennessee. That's in Tullahoma, Tennessee, in the Smoky Mountains. Our training was extremely severe in every way. It seemed that all tests of how much a human being could stand physically and mentally before collapsing or dying was first tried on the Rangers. We lost many good Ranger candidates through injury and death prior to commitment to combat. Though combat in its finality decides whether you live or die, it wasn't as tiring and brutal as our Ranger training was. Rangers share a lot of pain and exhaustion together, as well as bruises and contusions from time to time. We would frequently have five-mile runs before breakfast, march 25 or 30 miles by day and fight that night in maneuvers, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, climbed high mountains, the Smokies is pretty high in certain areas, and high cliffs, some up to 400 feet in height, no safety ropes. We received commando training with small boats in the English Channel for raids on the coast of France before D-Day. We also trained with other special forces group of the, of the times, such as the Navy Frogmen, as they were known then, they're now called SEALs, Marine Raiders, and British Commandos. We had lots of instruction on all weapons, maps, and military tactics. We seemed to always be bone tired, sweating, and aching. Speed marches with full field packs were made at an approximate speed of seven miles an hour. We were a light infantry strike force that moved very quickly, struck hard, and used the element of surprise. We possessed skills and, er and expertise in many ways necessary to quickly bring the enemy down or captured and held them until relieved by a larger number of men of whatever division we were working for or attached to for special combat um, situations. We didn't permit, I strike that, I, I stumble here, and the reason for it, uh, one of my daughters is an English teacher, English teacher at the local high school. She, she re at the high school. She read this last night and deleted part of my speech. <laughs> That's why I stumbled over. We were noted for our strong discipline and courage and determination to succeed. Bonding. All their ranger experiences and suffering and training or combat create an exceptionally strong bond among the rangers that they would never lose. They became truly closer to one another than blood, butter, blood brothers in many instances. We have a saying, ranger friendships are forever. Those of us who have survived have named our sons after ranger buddies. We wish we visit among ourselves and families frequently over the past 55 years. I've just returned from my reunion. 450 were in attendance. Family members are always included. Ranger life has always been a fa family oriented life. Each, family, each company is a family. In our creed, we vow, if necessary, to die for one another, and many have. We do not leave our dead behind. We bring them back with us after the mission is accomplished. General Eisenhower, commanding officer of all allied forces in the ETO in World War II stated, quote, the Rangers were extraordinary men. They could do anything, fight anywhere. They had a lot of courage and terrific morale, unquote. Our field generals we worked with explained in various ways that we were no, that there were no finer soldiers in any army at any time in history than the U.S. Army Rangers. When the impossible was needed, the Rangers were there and successfully accomplished the mission no matter how dangerous or what the odds were. The Rangers were among the best of the elite special operations forces. More deletions. Uh, our, oh yes, <laughs> our ladies regarded us as tough guys with big hearts and caring ways, so they said. We weren't going to argue with their appraisal. Leadership teaches you when to argue and when not to argue. Our ranger training helped stay our course through a successful civilian life that soon followed our discharge uh, from service. Incidentally, Having mentioned our ranger ladies a moment ago, let me tell you about one who climbed 100 foot cliffs with me after the war. Yes, you guessed too, my wife Charlotte. Stand up, Charlotte. And, and, and. Now bear with me because uh, you may not agree to do what I did, but in 1960, my wife and I were in Paris on business, we'll call it that. And uh, 
I was dressed in a nice black silk suit, suit and she was dressed lovely with high heels. And we had nothing to do that day in the breakfast. I said, what do you say we hop on the train and go to Normandy? There's something down here I want to show you. Being a good sport, she always is, or was, all these years. She said, why not? Down we go, hire a driver in a car, over to Point the Hawk. I want to show her because we've had so many ranger parties at our home, and she's the cook. She ought to know what the guys are talking about. And I got there, and it was beautiful. It was a nice day in June. And I said, uh, you know, Charlotte, somehow somebody in the years since World War II have jerry-rigged a, a, a way to get down this cliff. There was a rope then a section 10, 20 feet long of ladder, wooden ladder. Then it was another rope to a post and a ribbon in the side of it. And then different ways to get down. And I said, it looks to me that the French or whoever do the, does this sort of thing, that they can do it, maybe we could do it. And what if we could? Do you think you could come up? I'll be right behind you in case you fall, I'll catch you. But see, I would like the bragging rights of all the rangers that I have the only wife that climbed cliff, uh, uh, the cliffs at Point du Hoc. And she said, why not? And down we went. And you know what happened? The heavens opened up. We got soaked to the skin with a shower. And when that shower, as it was on D-Day, hits that clay in the side of the cliffs, the ropes are awfully slippery. And you can imagine what we looked like struggling up the cliffs with slippery ropes and the clay on it all over my black silk suit and her lovely dress. We got up at the top and we were a real mess. We had intended uh, to go back to Paris. That, it's only a four hour ride, but we were in no shape to travel. So we went to a local hotel and the lady proprietress there saw us and we explained to her the problem. She said, don't you worry, go on up to the room, take a shower, take a rest. And she cleaned up all our clothes, had it dry cleaned, and had us ready for a nice dinner. They eat much later over there, you know. So I say to you, back there is the only woman that I know of that's climbed Point to Hawk at Omaha Beach. <laughs> now, remembering D-Day, we were trained especially and psyched specifically for our D-Day mission. It was said to be the most dangerous and riskiest of D-Day missions. General Omar Bradley, commanding officer of all American ground forces in the, ATO, in the ATO, so stated in his book, Soldier Story. He also stated it was also one of the most important missions of D-Day because thousands of lives were dependent on its success. In fact, all Allied troops of all landing beaches who knew about the Rangers' mission were praying for our Rangers to timely destroy the guns of Point to Hot. Said to have a 10-mile range and be located on top of these 100-foot cliffs at Point to Hot, about halfway between Omaha Beach and Utah Beach in Normandy, France. The six large 155 millimeters, there's five-inch guns, coastal artillery guns, could shell all landing beaches and our armada of ships, about 5,000 or more ships, uh, landing troops and equipment as dawn came up, June 6, 1944. These landings were to go on all day, for days, if the invasions were to turn out successful. Remember, the Air Force had missed their Omaha Beach targets and the point to hot guns in their alternate position, among others, such as those that uh, Point de la Perse, where uh, um, Henry's father was with C Company. Um, so the guns of Point de Hoc and Point de la Perse, where Captain Solomon was, had to be put out of action as soon as possible, which they were. This objective burned deep in the minds and hearts of our young rangers, a burden of responsibility that they would never forget and have not to this day. Approximately, uh, approximately 225 especially chosen rangers from the 2nd Ranger Battalion, companies D, E, and F, and part of headquarters started out early D-Day morning to land an assault and to land an assault 100 foot cliffs of Point to Hock. I might point out so you can vis visualize it's 100 foot is like a nine story building straight up with ropes uh, and climb them under fire from the Germans. About 180 ranges out of the 225 made it to the top and established a beachhead or should we call it a cliff head. Within an hour or so of the landing, the big guns were found and destroyed. 
The, road, the roadblock, the second part of the mission, was established. All German communications were cut and destroyed. That was the third part of the mission. All that was left to do was fight off Germans for two and a half days, at times outnumbered 10 to 1 before relief arrived. Our mission was not only successful, but was the first one completed on D-Day. We had to hurry because the bombers missed their targets on the high ground and cliffs along a seven mile wide area called Bloody Omaha Beach on a 60 mile front of the landing areas. Now, I want you to picture this, uh, seven miles where we're in, we're in Abington, uh, where would that take you past the turnpike maybe to uh, Horsham? Is that about seven miles? Well, that's how wide Omaha Beach is. Uh, Point to Hawk was on the west flank, the extreme west flank, and the Englishmen with their beaches were on the eastern left flank. Now, most of that waterfront along there for 60 miles, that's how wide the entire landing area was, uh, is high ground. If it isn't high bluffs going up almost uh, five or six hundred feet, it's cliffs going up a hundred feet. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to say that, uh, 50, 60 feet, the bluffs were not as high as the cliffs, but it was high ground. And in behind that high ground, or on the high ground, in the case of Bloody Omaha, were two divisions of Germans with all their heavy 88s and heavy uh, fire from their 50 calibers and that. Which, By the way, has anyone in here, hold up your hand if you've seen Saving Private Ryan. That's what we're going to talk about just for the moment. If you've seen that, that's the first and second wave. That's about our second battalion, not the Hollywood story part of it, but the, um, the landing part, the military part, was accurate. That's, uh, the reproduction of that is about as accurate, uh, accurate as you can get without killing somebody. Uh, so you can see how it was. Uh, now, it said C Company. Well, I, I know they had me come and critique it and all that, but that wasn't Henry's father's company. Henry's father's company's assignment and mission was to take Point de la Perse, the 90-foot cliffs on the west end or beyond the west end of the sandy beaches of Bloody Omaha, which they did. And his father's Company C lost 50 percent of their men in the first 25 minutes. And as a matter of fact, they fought their way, and only nine guys got up on top of those cliffs, and his father was one of them, that took down the Germans. They had Germans, but when they were finished, they had Germans piled up like cordwood. They killed so many of them in taking that gun position. They took out the controls uh, area. They took out the guns and everything down to the actual west end of the sandy beach of Omaha Beach, where there are still positions there to this day. Bunkers, I don't think they'll ever get out. Uh, but that's what Henry's father and his C Company did of my battalion. Uh, his company and my company had the highest casualties of D-Day in the Rangers. Um, well, the Rangers had, in fact, as intended, saved thousands of lives on D-Day. Uh, they successfully assaulted Point de Hoc, enabling the, and there's other high gun positions, enabling the invasion fleet to move closer to shore, making all landings easier and safe that day. But who personally found and destroyed, and destroyed the guns of Point de Hoc? Uh, on the back table back there, there is this report from our, uh, from our national historian, Lou Lisko, that tells the story of how that was done. A copy of the same as the detail will be made available to each of you if you are interested to speak to our host. Briefly summarized, First Sergeant Leonard G. Lomel and Staff Sergeant Jack Kuhn. Uh, I'm retired. Jack's retired. He's a retired Chief of Police of Altoona, Pennsylvania. We, by 8.15 that morning, found and destroyed the guns of Point de Hoc. Pure luck. We were at the right place at the right time on patrol. We did what we were specially trained to do, as any ranger would have done. No heroics here. We suddenly looked over a high hedgerow, and there were the 555 millimeter, five inch coastal guns in their alternate position, camouflaged in an apple orchard in a large swale. There was not a shell or a bomb crater in sight of them. 
I mention that because in our training, we could only train from aerial photographs given to us by the Air Force. And they were always showing this great fortress known as Point de Hoc Fortress, which it, tend, which it proved to be because they had a lot of underground tunnels and crew quarters. It was all underground there. It was fantastic. But you must remember that it had been bombed for four months uh, before D-Day. Whenever uh, flights of the uh, Royal Air Force or our Air Force came back from uh, bombings in Germany, they would drop the excess bombs off on Point de Hoc. Well, it didn't take a brain specialist to realize what was going on here. Not that they were expecting an invasion, but he sure didn't think it was a good place for their guns. So the German commandant moved the guns off the point to an alternate position. We never were furnished with guns, I mean, the photographs, aerial photographs showing the guns in their alternate position in this apple orchard. Uh, nor, not, we weren't furnished with the photos so we could study them and know about the alternate position, but we didn't even get the reports from the underground from the France, that, from the French that went to the army to headquarters, the guns had been moved. So when we got up there, it was a big disappointment to us uh, not find them. But we found, we went to the positions and we found that they, what they had out there was telephone poles. And from the air, the photographs that we studied, it looked like the barrels or tubes of the guns. Well, uh, let's see, it was, the men, we found, uh, we uh, suddenly discovered there was about 75 men 100 yards away being talked to by their uh, leader. Now, picture this. This is 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.15 in the morning. It's daylight, and they're just coming out from wherever they've been hiding after all the shelling, and, the, and my rest of my rangers are out there on Point de Hoc uh, trying to kill all their guys in their fire control bunker so they can't call back fire orders to this gun group that Jack and I are trying to knock out. So they're over there being briefed by their... Uh, Officer, we couldn't understand. We couldn't even hear it. But we just, we seized that opportunity. And that's why I say we're at the right place at the right time. There they are over there getting briefed or whatever they were doing. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, there was an, another little glitch here that scared the hell out of us. Uh, before Jack and I went down, after setting up the roadblock and destroying the uh, uh, communications, we, there was only this one road going through these pastures. They have them in France and Normandy. Every so many pastures is a road off the main road that goes between the pastures to another part of a farm. Um, where am I? See what happens when you get old. Uh, anyway, we went down there. Uh, but just prior to going down there, we heard this clanking and all kinds of noise. And we had just moved into position to set up the roadblock and do what we had to do there when we heard this noise. And lo and behold, it's a combat patrol of Germans with mortars, heavy machine guns. Uh, it's been debated over the years whether it was 30, 40, or 50 of them. They look like a hell of a lot of guys to me looking for trouble. Fortunately, they're headed for Utah Beach. Our orders were in establishing that roadblock only to stop the Germans coming from Utah Beach to Omaha, to Omaha Beach. Our brass didn't want any more Germans on Omaha Beach than necessary. So they were going the opposite way. We decided, and I'm praying nobody's going to shoot at them or get finger, trigger happy. Uh, but so the fire discipline, we didn't fire on them because we had no time to get into a fight with them. We're trying to find guns at that moment in time to put them out of action. And that's what we did. Uh, we laid low in the ditches, and they went right by on the other side of this wall of a pasture, and they went down about, oh, I think a couple hundred yards. We could see them because they went right by our roadblock and didn't see it because they're behind the wall. They turned left and went in a farm road just like Jack and I were about to go in, and we did and found the guns that parallel them. And they met up with those fellas uh, that we saw, which were the gun crews of the guns of Point to Hawk. So anyway, we then, uh, Jack said he would cover me. I'd go in, and uh, we had two thermite grenades. Now, you remember, we had to go hand over hand. I, we're carrying submachine guns and a sidearm, and one uh, thermite grenade. That's 
fatter than a beer can and longer than a beer can. It makes no noise. It's not like a fragmentation grenade. It blows up things with shrapnel and that sort of thing. This is, contains an incendiary. You lay it on moving parts, like traversing mechanisms, elevation, hinges on bridge blocks and that, and you pull a pin, there's no explosion, but when the air hits the incendiary inside, it turns to molten metal, and it affects, in effect, it welds together all the moving parts that you lay it upon. Well, he had one, I had one, and every other guy had of ours out the roadblock had one, because we have to be as light as we can to go up a 109-story building or 100 feet of hand over hand. So uh, I took out two guns with that. There was nobody in the position at that moment. <clears throat> and I took my field jacket off and wrapped it around my submachine gun stock and smashed the sights of all five of them. Ran back to the hedgerow and said, Jack, we got to go back to the guys and get the rest of them while we get the chance. Well, how long does it take uh, young guys that are in great shape to run 100, 150 yards? We got the rest of the thermite grenades, brought them back, looked over the hedgerow to see if the Germans had come back to the position they hadn't. We went right in there. He took care of covering me, and I made him promise to even look this way, get him. I went in and destroyed the rest of the guns and had more grenades than I needed, and I put them right on every other gun. So what the Germans found when they ultimately got back to their position, not a thing, nothing was disturbed. Their powder bags, their projectiles, their, everything was in textbook readiness for use. But they couldn't use them because my guys on the uh, point uh, killed their observers and no firing orders were getting back. So Jack and I thought, well, they've probably got a mobile OP trying to find a place to uh, set up to get fire orders back so they can go back in their positions and resume firing the guns as planned. Now, rather than write all this stuff, and uh, I'm just telling you uh, uh, the problems we face in finding guns, uh, I'll talk to you extemporaneously, as I have. As we go along, we might, uh, you might say I'm an eyewitness or give you an eyewitness account and explain the large D-Day maps I have here and the pictures of Point to Hawk as I, that I brought along. Now, my daughter said, you've got to remind yourself of this, of all of these things, you might get questioned. Well, I'll never forget them, but I might not get them in the order she'd like me to get them in. But I, I know what she's saying to me because I guess I'm getting forgetful too. But anyway, I've told you, as, and rushed as I am, I've given you the, few, the full picture of my D-Day with the second range of the tank. I told you all about them. And now I will entertain questions from you uh, as long as you'd like. And then I'll finish up with a conclusion. Yes, sir. How difficult was it initially? I didn't hear you. How difficult was it initially to climb the cliffs? How difficult was it initially to climb the cliffs? How difficult was it initially? 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 Uh, how difficult was it climbing the cliffs, getting up? Well, you know, uh, at Point du Hoc, it has a very narrow uh, ledge of a beach. I don't think it was more than 15, 20, 25 yards. Uh, the ramps go down. We were, uh, these LCAs we were in, we had 12 of them. Two of them sunk on us. We lost two boatloads of guys. Uh, the ramps went down, the boat leader, which I was, the boat leader of my boat, and I go off right off the ramp forward, and my men go off to the right, and we rush to the bottom of the cliff to go up those ropes. Um, well, the ramp went down, I got shot, ran off the thing, thinking I was going to be in uh, knee-deep water, and went out of sight. Apparently one of the bombs missed the, alleged, or the edge of the cliff, fell in the water, and underneath the water was a shell crater that we couldn't see. And they, my guys rescued me, dragged me out. I was soaked. And uh, I was all right. 
uh, we ran over to the uh, ropes. We grabbed any rope we could see. But as that ramp went down, we had men who pressed the buttons of the uh, rocket launchers that took our grapnels up over the cliffs and grabbed them at the top of the cliffs that left all these various ropes, toggle ropes, and other ways for us to get to the top to 100 feet. How difficult it was? Well, you know, we were young and the best of shape, and I'll tell you, physical conditioning is the big thing with the Rangers. Um, it was difficult. I, I just had enough strength myself to make it, and I was no great athlete or a great strong man. I did have, we had what we call monkeys, uh, these gorillas that got more muscles than they know what to do with. They're supposed to go up first with BARs and spray the uh, Germans back to keep them away because when we did this, they're on the edge of the cliff dropping boulders on us, cutting our ropes, shooting down on us, and that sort of thing, trying to drive us back into the sea. So, yes, it was difficult, but we really didn't worry about that. Uh, we were so confident that if they don't kill us, one of us is going to get through. You see, the beautiful thing about the Rangers, everybody knows what the mission is. Uh, we don't care what your rank is. We don't care who you are, what company you're in. Get the job done. Get the mission accomplished. So we were confident that somebody was going to do it. Uh, and I'll tell you a little aside here. You may not find any humor in it, but we did. Uh, each of our boats in our company were betting anywhere from two to three, four hundred dollars that our boat was going to be the one that did the job. So when two of our boats went down, we then got up and applauded and raved because that's less competition. Now that that's the true story. Uh, uh, fortunately, only four guys four guys drowned. Our strongest swimmers. The rest of them were rescued. But um, it was difficult. But we didn't think it was difficult at the time. And you know, when you have a lot on your mind and you're worried about your men and keeping them all together and getting the job done, you don't have time to think about yourself. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I didn't hear you. From England in a landing craft? No, no. We were in Weymouth. And by the way, next June I'm taking another group, I've been doing this every five years for many years, back on the anniversary dates of D Day. And they're going to welcome us and have a big ceremony because we got on our transport. Now, our transport was a, a, a channel steamer. A channel steamer is a small, what can I call it, cruise ship that ran between England and France, see? So that was our uh, transport. So we got aboard the transports, and they have on their side, instead of lifeboats, these smaller LCAs that hold about 25 fellas. So we went to the staging area, and that's an interesting thing I want to show you here. Because I, it was a like to show here uh, any of this? Well, that'll help, yes. Where did they come from? I came, my men came from, uh, you want to do it on the, the, the thing here. When, uh, I can walk over here. Yeah. I can do it better. <coughs> Our transport was at Weymouth. They're the ones that are going to welcome us. How about, how about holding this too so you can put it on? Yeah, that helps, doesn't it? This is Weymouth where we got on our transports that had in the position of light boats our LCAs, which were manned, the whole ship was, by the British Navy. And they took us across from the assembly area all the way up to the landing area. This is Normandy Beach from here to here, some six, 60 miles wide, and landed us at Omaha Beach. Um, no, we got to the staging area, not the staging area, but the area, uh, for instance, on this map, I dug up a map that I was unaware of, but it's interesting. It would, it would be interesting for you uh, Navy fellas here because I didn't know you had such plans. You were really thorough. This is an assault landing map map of uh, D-Day, these lines are where the transports and the Navy ships, the destroyers, all of this you see here, this on the Eastern Task Force, that's the British Navy. Over here is the American Navy and how they bring their barrier ships in, their destroyers, their battleships, 
uh, their transports, and they all are out here in a temporary area laying 10 miles off the coast because the guns that point to Hawk, and this is point to Hawk, uh, which protrudes out into the English Channel, can fire 10 miles any way, 360 degrees. They can fire on all the ships, here, here, over here, and all the beaches, meaning that thousands and thousands of people aboard ship and on the landing beaches could be killed if those guns were not taken out. Unfortunately, uh, they had not been taken out. They were there. And if you've seen, if you've seen it, Private Ryan, you know why Omaha Beach is known as Bloody Omaha. Now, the Air Force was accurate in the British sector. They were accurate at Point to Hawk, although the guns weren't there. But they still are. They hit that point, and thank God they did, because the craters that they left behind, which we were never trained to do anything with, came in handy to us to pr protect us as we made our way across the point to the gun positions, because we would wait till the fires drop and quit. Then we'd dash out of the... Uh, a crater into another crater, and little by little we made our way out to the uh, coast road. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, what did you do after you knocked out these five guns, and these German gun crews, and these combat crews that you said had What did we do? What did you and the crew do after you had done? Well, we were only 150, I'll tell you. I told you when uh, I, no, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. But we did the job. And I rushed back to the hedgerow. And now, let me explain. Hedgerows, as you no doubt know by now, can be as much as eight or nine uh, feet high, trees out at the top of them, 15, 20 feet at the base. They're big. You could have hidden a tank column in the sunken road that Sergeant Kuhn and I went down. After we uh, destroyed the guns, I went back to Jack, and as we were crawling, as I crawled up to him, up on this nine-foot hedgerow, and a, a large explosion occurred. We men immediately jumped to the conclusion it was a short round from the Texas. You see, they were our uh, artillery, you might say. The Texas, uh, we used them for firepower. We used the destroyers because we had none of our own. Now, what did we do? We ran back as quick, like a couple scared rabbits, to our roadblock. Where our 10 men, they looked like 110 men to us at that point in time. We're so glad to see friendly faces. So we went back to the roadblock, and we stayed in the roadblock for two and a half days, or in that area, because that night, D-Day night, uh, remember now, I only have 20, uh, 10, 12 of us, and I started out with 22. I'm down to 10, and Jack and I made 12. Uh, our first platoon came and joined us about 9 o'clock, they were half gone too, shot or killed. And uh, our two platoons, what was left of them, of D Company of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, held on to the uh, roadblock and followed out our orders from Colonel Rudder that we were to maintain that until relieved. Well, we had to set up a perimeter for that night, D-Day night. Uh, by D-Day night, by 8, 9 o'clock that night, we had then acc accumulated remnants of the other companies to we had a 85 rangers, and we set up our perimeter for that night to defend the area and the guns. Well, the Germans were pretty angry, and they, they came at us with 300 men. They uh, counterattacked us three different times, and we had heavy casualties. They uh, took away one platoon of E Company, killed their leader, and rest were prisoners or casualties. And then they disappeared. Uh, we didn't give up. We fought them, and, and uh, as bad as it was, they thought there were actually more of us than there was. So they figured, uh, hey, we're not going to get rid of these guys this way. So lo and behold, after the third counterattack, they never came around again. So uh, along about 6 o'clock in the morning, as daylight is starting, um, E Company and F Company, what was left of it, decided they would withdraw back to Colonel Rudder, who was having his problems around the perimeter of the point, uh, with Germans counterattacking there regularly. But D Company stayed at the roadblock until relieved. And then on D plus 2, 
um, uh, the uh, fifth battalion, fifth ranger battalion, what was left of uh, Henry's father's outfit, C Company, over our battalion, and A and B Company, were there to relieve us, uh, and so our wounded could be tended to. Uh, of the 225, we had 90 guys left standing after the two and a half day battle. Now, I want to tell you something that doesn't appear in the history books, and. And there's all so much that doesn't appear in the history books, but here's what happened. The 5th Ranger Battalion, or RAB, A and B Company, were never intended to land on Omaha Beach. What really happened was the 5th Ranger Battalion was a part of a Ranger Force of the 2nd Ranger Battalion and the 5th, that's a Ranger Force, two battalions, under the command of Colonel James R. Rudder, James Earl Rudder. Colonel Schneider of, was uh, the commanding officer of the 5th Battalion. They were to lay off Point de Hoc. And if our, our, if our 225 guys were to fail or be driven back into the sea, they were to come in and rescue us and finish the mission and find those guns and put them out of action. Well, fortunately, we didn't need them, and uh, Colonel Rudder's uh, radio men gave them the message to go to Omaha Beach and help out and come back up the coast road and join us as soon as you can. So they turned and went eastward from uh, uh, Point to Hawk to uh, Omaha Beach and when they got there they saw the hell of the Beerville draw and what you saw in a Private Ryan and, uh, and they saw immediately where all the fire was coming from and where the bad part of that beach was. So Colonel Schneider, in his wisdom, and being an experienced uh, uh, leader of such uh, uh, invasions as they did in North Africa and Italy, he took his troops a bit further east and brought them in where there wasn't all this fire and uh, confrontation and conflict. And he managed to get across the beach. Would I don't think he had more than six or seven casualties, but as a unit, an organized unit. Now you remember, Omaha Beach was in a state of chaos and confusion, as far as someone in control. It was there that uh, General Coda came and said, "Who are you guys?" And then he said, uh, "Well, if your Rangers lead the way," and that's what happened. They got up. To, uh, they uh, got up to the draw. Beerville draw went through the draw on the high ground and, uh, and with the rest of the troops following them, drove the Germans inland, and then the commanding officer of the 29th and uh, Coda decided to use the 5th Battalion and the remnants of the A and B companies of the 2nd Battalion as a perimeter guard that night to help uh, defend what little land was taken. <coughs> you know, uh, to help you understand that, there are other maps I'll show you here, and you can come up afterward or whenever you want. This is the D-Day, D-Day beaches. This is the way it was by 12 noon on D-Day. This is Omaha Beach. No, I take that back. This is second ranch, this is second British, first US armies we're talking about. This is the British sector. This is Omaha Beach. That's seven miles uh, by noontime on D-Day conquered and established beachhead. This is Point to Hawk. I'm not kidding me, said a bridgehead, I mean a, a, a cliffhead, but that is a, 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 just like this, a beachhead. And that's only 225 men that did that much work. This is uh, here, 30, 30 40,000 men have done this. And this is Utah Beach. That's by noontime on D-Day. This is the English. Now this map uh, will show you the R's are for Rangers, 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 Rangers. Uh, Rangers, 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 as they came up here. Now we're up here along these cliffs here. The 5th Battalion and A, B, and C Company, when they come and can get going the next day, not the day, not D-Day or D-Day night, but uh, the next two days, they fight their way up the coast here to come help us and join forces because we're going to move out this way anyway. Anyway, this was the day, uh, this was the line, D-Day night, of so much of the um, invasion area 
uh, conquered by American forces and the English forces over here. Uh, they expected to do much better than that. Uh, they thought they were going to be this far in D-Day night, but they weren't. This was their line then. And in a couple of days, they got out here, and then the rest is history. But to refresh your recollection or anything that I might have said, uh, or tried to explain to you extemporaneously here. Now, these maps are a big help. This is another one that could be of help to you. I don't know, Alex, if that's on. Is it on your uh, screen there? Uh, you can see the various units involved in this. Um, this is Omaha Beach, and this is where the Rangers were at Point de Hoc, and this is Grand Comp. And this is Utah Beach, and these are the English. But this tells you uh, quite a bit of information. This is where the paratroopers were uh, up around uh, St. Mary Glees. And they helped, uh, of course, as you know, they helped the Utah Beach fellas uh, come ashore. And, but nothing was as bad as Omaha Beach that you've heard so much about, bloody Omaha. Any other questions? Yes, sir. After the airport, how to back off, you know, when you... Yeah, we didn't have any that I know, other than if we could get word to the Texas. Well, I'll show you an example of our base fire. Uh, there was, uh, uh, if you see, or if I can show it to you on the map, I uh, know these are too small, but anyway, uh, point to Hawk with the Rangers took those guns out in their alternate position, juts out into the English Channel. And it has a little cove there. On each side of it, there's this little cove. And they had machine guns uh, positions cemented into the side of the cliff, concrete and steel and everything. We didn't know that at first, because you couldn't see them. They were camouflaged. But as we're trying to get up, we know we're getting fire from the flanks here. And they were in the side of the cliffs. Well, there was no way for us on the top of the cliff to get down 30 or 40 feet where they were had a nice little uh, position inside the cliff where they come down from tunnels and other ways to get in and out of their position. This was a hell of a fortress, you know, uh, the strongest one on the Atlantic Wall. Well, uh, we sent patrols out and the guys kept coming. There's nothing we can do. So suddenly they figured, well, those destroyers out there, they're willing to do anything, and they were wonderful. Those guys came in in shallow water, and they didn't care about uh, any fire from rifles or machine guns uh, from the uh, Germans, and they came up close enough to blow those machine guns right out of the side of the cliffs, right back into the water, which got them off our hands. We could never have done it. We didn't have any field artillery outfits. We didn't have any armory, any army field artillery to help us. We had to rely on destroyers or the battleships. Uh, the big failure at Omaha Beach was the amphibious tanks, correct? They were swamped, they sank, not that many got ashore. That, that's true, but uh, I don't think that's the guy's failure. I think whoever planned it that way, uh, it was their failure uh, in the sense that I wouldn't think a tank would float very well myself, uh, but they found out. I guess they lost about, uh, what, uh, 30, 40 of them. Right. If the tanks had come ashore, would they have minimized casualties? Oh, sure, but they couldn't get ashore because the big guns were still there. You know, uh, the, there was an army division, a German army division up there in position. They were changing over. A new one came in that day not knowing there was going to be, not the day before, not knowing there was going to be an invasion. You follow me? They're going to relieve the old division so they can go get some R&R &R or do whatever they have to do or new assignments. So the new guys are going to take over the high ground in back of Omaha Beach. And suddenly, the next morning, here comes this invasion. So there was two divisions up there with all their heavy fire their heavy machine guns, and their 88s, and you know, everybody knows the 88s was the finest artillery weapon in the war, or until late in the war at least. So you had all that high ground in back of Omaha Beach, where the cemetery now is, if any of you have been over there, 
and uh, none of those guys were knocked out of action. And those of you who've seen uh, uh, Private Ryan, you saw those heavy machine guns shooting right into the, when the ramps went down, they just killed them right in the LCAs before they had a chance to get off the, uh, the LCAs. And of course, a lot of them drowned. And you must remember, a place like the beach portion of it, uh, they'll, from the water's edge, you can go two or three hundred yards. The, the rise and fall of the tide is such that it comes in fast and it goes out fast. So they had to uh, make the landing at 6.30. Many of the guys never made that landing. They had to get off schedule because it was so terrible. The tidal shifts, the sea was high, the weather was horrible, and of course, we were told, or the men were told, there would be a piece of cake with all that, you know, thousands of airplanes going over. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a big admirer of the Air Force. We couldn't have won World War II without them. They're marvelous. But we all make mistakes. We all miss targets sometimes. Hard to get anybody to admit it, <laughs> but we all do make mistakes. On that day, there were some mistakes made. Their bombs fell. I'm talking about tons of bombs. I'm talking about tons of uh, artillery and rockets missed their targets by one to three miles. It happens. Uh, I don't know why. They said they were afraid of dropping in on guys on the beach. Well, the whole bombing sequence was started early in the morning for two or three hours before H hour, 6.30. All of that was to be done, lifted, and then we hit that beach. We're on our way in. It takes a couple hours to get in, you know. Uh, so uh, the only excuse that I've ever heard is they were afraid of hitting guys on the beach. Well, there shouldn't have been any guys on the beach, and there weren't any guys on the beach, and they were unopposed. Now they say that the 17s that were above the low ceiling may not have been able to see the beach. That may be true, but I didn't think they could see all their targets through World War II. Uh, but they bomb anyway. That's the kind of sights they had. But then you had two other la layers of bombers below the ceiling, the A's uh, and the uh, 24s, I think. Now, they hit their targets not more than three miles up the beach run at Point de Hoc at Utah Beach. They had any trouble with accuracy. And uh, the, um, the uh, English beaches, the, the Royal Air Force and the Canadians, they didn't have, to, they didn't have that problem. I don't know why it happened, but it happened, and that's why this is known as Bloody Omaha. And if you see Ryan's show, you'll understand why. Yes, sir? You commented about the Air Force a number of times. Did you have any fighter support? Yes. Uh, I bought a book today. It's in my bag. I'll get it out. Uh, we did. And they were, I, listen, don't get me wrong, but we have what we call Friendly fire. Uh, we we take that as a given. That's going to happen wherever you are. We fight close with the Air Force. They bombed for us, and they did wonderful jobs. Uh, but I got to tell you, uh, yes, we had a little trouble. It's a hell of a story, too. I bought this book today. It's got two pages in it about the point to hawk. Just says it was a, a rough deal to climb those cliffs. It doesn't tell you, doesn't tell you what uh, uh, about finding the guns and actually destroying the guns. And they've had that wrong ever since Cornelius Ryan, the longest day, said those brave men made that climb and there were no guns. And that's the end of the story. And so it is in this book. But I wanted to show you. In this book, it has the uh, American flag draped over our point to hawk. That was to warn off the friendly fire we were getting from the fighters were coming down. Because they do such a wonderful job, and we don't blame them for, any, blame them for anything, because uh, we call for fire on top of us, around us, and so close as we're bound to get hurt sometime. But to safeguard it, we put American flags here and there so we don't get straight to shot. I, I don't want to imply, because I'm a big supporter of the Air Force. Yes, sir? guns that you took out the five guns, whatever happened to them? Did the Germans just leave them there, or did they take them with them when they retreated, or what happened to them? Oh, no. When we put them out of action, we chased the Germans away. They're long gone. They never came back. So the guns just sat 
just sat there. I don't know whether, whether they were salvaged or whatever the Frenchman did with them. I know there's one of them at the entrance to Point de Hoc. You know, Point de Hoc is a big park today. Uh, it remains in its, uh, the way we left it. They have one there at the entrance way. And it was a gentleman that walked up here to me just a moment before we started, said he just came back from Normandy. Are you, are you still with me? Yeah. Was, did you see the big uh, gun at the entrance way? That's one of them. There were five of them. They're French made, by the way, not German made. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Wasn't there a heavy naval bombardment of the beaches before the landings were made? Was that ineffective? Uh, well, it, uh, I, let me put it this way. There were no shell craters on Omaha Beach of any description. Now, that's important to us guys, because when we're told it's going to be a piece of cake, we think about those things. If there were craters there, we could hide in craters, as we did it where I was, because there were craters. They were accurate where I was. But at Omaha Beach, and that's your question, there were no craters. That indicates to me uh, no bombs or shells hit that beach. You see what I mean? So um, what can I say to answer the question? There was no evidence of it. Now, I saw for the first time D-Day morning, which he was talk about fireworks coming into that beach. Everything was blowing up. But uh, I saw for the first time the floats, the barges of rockets that uh, perforate a whole acre when they land. Uh, I didn't know where they were going. I wasn't paying attention, but I would see them go off. I've learned since in my research that they fell in the water short of the beach. I, I don't know. I didn't see him. I had other things on my mind that day. Yes, sir. Second and fifth rangers in Fortress Brest and during the bulge, were they uh, uh, tough heights? Uh, uh, oh, tough heights? They were tough. Oh, yes, tough. By the way, folks, I got hearing aids in both ears, and I'm reading lips right now <laughs> because I can't turn it up because the sound system here will have it. Y yes, uh, they were very tough fights. And I have, in the past, taken the guys back the 2nd and 5th to all our battle areas and visited them. We were at Brest to the 2nd Battalion. Yes, sir? I just want to defend the Navy. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You don't have to defend the Navy because uh, the Tin Can Boys are our best friends. Well, my ship was sitting right off of there. We could see you climbing up, whatever. But the second night, we took the Quincy back to Portsmouth because we were low on ammunition at Quincy. Now, it went someplace. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Oh, listen, we, we are fond uh, uh, and good friends of the uh, destroyers in the Texas to this day. Uh, it was only, uh, what is this now, 55 years next June? It was only like 10 years ago that I discovered something about you guys uh, that I thought was underhanded and unfortunate. I will not forgive you. Uh, we were sitting around drinking one night at a reunion with you guys, the tank of uh, the destroyers, and uh, one of the destroyer guys said, what about our two, uh, what do you call those boats, your uh, whale boats? And the hundreds of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches we brought in. <laughs> now this is D-Day, or D plus one. And I look at some guys from the point. I was in the inland battle area where the guns were. And I said, Lou, that's our national historian, I said, you know about that? He said, because he was the signal man there on a point. He says, yeah. And then I find out that everybody ate uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that were coming out their ears. And not one, not even you guys, the destroyers had the common decency to ask for a patrol to take a couple dozen out to us that were in the outland there fighting. <laughs> that's, the, that's what happens. <laughs> well, those things happen, but it takes years to uncover these things. <laughs> no, that's true, and we were hungry. We hadn't eaten in two days. <laughs> Point to hope, because they make their C's like an E, H-O-E. It took me to, I didn't know it was, I always, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, 
I did not think they fired. Jack and I looked. I didn't see any evidence. Everything was in readiness. I reported back that I didn't see any evidence of them ever being fired. And furthermore, I didn't think they had. I didn't see any shells, uh, as you see, in a position of artillery after they've been fired. They were pointed at Utah Beach, not Omaha Beach. I reported that. Then later, uh, historical records indicated they had been fired. But in answer to your questions, we were the first guys there. I don't believe it one bit that they were ever fired. We put them out of action uh, before they could be fired. So I don't know. And then they never were fired thereafter. And then incidentally, three or four days later, uh, General uh, Omar Bradley moved his, uh, his headquarters off the Augusta, was it, uh, off the ships to shore in Normandy and set up his headquarters on D plus four or five. It's in this book, The Soldier's Story, right next to our guns. You see what I mean? And they remain that way ever after, frozen as we welded them together with those thermite grenades. No, to answer your question, I don't think they were, and I don't care what the brass says. And they still say they were. I don't know where they got that information. Yes, sir. Name, by the way, is gold. gold. Yes, well, they're here. Uh, right. Let me finish, sir, if I may. There was a very large contingent of our northern neighbors, the Canadians, not English. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Right. Very important to point that out because I happen to be the next Canadian. Oh, well. <laughs> well, then you know all about the EP. Listen, you'll never hear me say anything about the Canadians. They do a good job. Yeah. Well, I assume I assume that they can see it right there. Gold, isn't that right? Gold, you know, and sword? So there they are, the three on that side of Omaha and Utah. I... Oh, sure, sure. Sorry, I forgot to point that out, sir. Anything else? Oh, <laughs> I understand that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. on D-Day? Tanks. What tanks did on D-Day? I never saw a tank on D-Day. They all Yes, yes they are. Um, yes, yes. Um, you know, I want to uh, speak about that beach. You're talking about Omaha Beach. Um, after that first two waves that you saw in Private Ryan, the, settle the uh, invasion as such slowed down. And uh, Captain Solomon, uh, Henry's father, was up on the top of the west end of the beach looking down. He thought that the invasion had been abandoned because there was a couple hours here. There wasn't much action as far as further waves coming in until they got things organized. And at about 11 o'clock, I guess it assumed, uh, resumed some order uh, of uh, proficiency, and they did then start coming in more. But there was uh, there was a question mark whether they want to go. On, they were going to continue with it, 
as they had planted or maybe move over to the English beach. Yes. Uh, let's give the tank divisions a chance to have two, two minutes in here. Your name okay. and... Uh, uh, Martin Goldstein. Okay. Yeah. Just keep it that okay. Way. I served in the 2nd Armored Division during World War II in North Africa, Sicily, and all through Europe. And uh, what I wanted to bring out is that the uh, 743rd Tank Battalion that was attached to the 29th Division landed on D-Day, and it was really a disaster, like Lennon mentioned. And that was because we didn't have the expertise or the knowledge to use the right equipment. Uh, the British said, uh, take advice from us. And, you know, the American Army is stubborn. They don't want to take advice from any other country. So the result was... Uh, it was a disaster. There was only three tanks that actually landed on the beach. The other 30, I think they're 39 or 40, were completely wiped out, drowned or shot out by 88s uh, up on those cliffs. So the, uh, the uh, people wrote out about the Navy and the Air Force helping out, and I wanted to mention this about tanks. How many men were in the tank? Uh, medium tank Sherman were five in World War II. We had a, a driver, a, a system driver, who was a 30 caliber uh, machine gunner. We had the tank commander. Uh, we had the gunner and the radio operator. And each person was able to do the other person's job in case somebody got hurt or killed or whatever. But uh, it was really a disaster because we came in D plus two. The beachhead wasn't big enough for a complete armored division. So we assembled an area for about three days and then we went up to uh, meet the uh, 101st Airborne Division who had dropped in Carentan. They had a counterattack from a SS German regiment. And the Germans didn't know that there was uh, heavy uh, tanks uh, on the beach at that time. So it was quite a big battle, and of course we wiped them out, and that took care of that. But, uh, yeah? Who were the idiots that ever dreamed up that you could make a Sherman an amphibious tank? Well, that's what I'm saying. It was ridiculous. Yeah. See, out in the Pacific, they used the ducks the alligators, the alligator right. And even the British and Canadians, they used different type of equipment to land than we did. And the, the British told our people, you're not going to be able to do anything with those medium tanks landing on the beach. But here again, as I say, you know, we don't listen to anybody. And our tanks were a disaster, I hate to tell you that. I was knocked out in two of them, and luckily I'm still alive, but uh, we had a short barrel 75 millimeter, and it was like a pea shooter. They bounced off the uh, panther and the tiger tanks like, you know, it was nothing. So the, when, when the war was almost over, we got a good tank with a 90 millimeter gun that did the job, but the war was, was almost gone then. That's true that the Limeys called the Sherman a Tommy Cooker, correct? Well, don't forget, you have to remember this. A lot of the British tanks were uh, our Shermans, but what they did, uh, they installed better guns on them. Uh, they had a problem of getting equipment, and through that Lend-Lease, we were sending a lot of medium tanks over to uh, the British. And they also had a tank they called the Churchill, which was a, um, I think they referred to him as an 18-pounder, which was a little bit lower in caliber than our 75. But uh, now, of course, we have the right tank when the war, when there are no wars. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Appreciate Thank that. Yeah. Okay. Before we wrap up the story tonight, I've got a little bit of administrative work that I have to do. We have about 28 people in the overflow room. They find that they can see and hear very good in there, so um, in the future, if you can't get in or if you're all the way in the back and you'd like a better view, maybe the overflow room will work for you. But right now, I've counted 128 people, and I need to know for the record how many, and let me get the details. Hold on. I need, I need to know how many are preschool age one to five. We've seen a few of those. Uh, can we get a raise a hand or stand up on the one to five? Is there two over here? No, uh, none. How about elementary school six to 13? Six to 13, one, two, two over here, four. Um, Six to 13. High school, age 14 to 18. One, two, two, okay. 
thanks very much. I can uh, fill out the records here. Now, Lynn has a little bit more to finish up. There are three items that I'd like to call to your attention in the back. Those of you that are familiar with it, we've been signing a petition to send in for um, Captain McVeigh of the USS Indianapolis. There's information back there on it. There's House Bill 3710 that gives all the details on it. There are copies of it that you can pick up. If you'd be interested in signing the petition, there's plenty of uh, spaces still available. We have the donation uh, envelope and in, uh, envelopes and a picture back there that will be raffled off. If you uh, put your name and phone number on an envelope with a dollar or more in it, then you'll be uh, into it, uh, into the raffle, which will be given, uh, chosen next at the next meeting. And then on the right, I've put a number of books out that are available from the library for checkout. And uh, if you don't have time to get them tonight, you might want to come back tomorrow and get them. Or uh, if, you, uh, if we break in time, a few of you can get them taken care of. The show has a lot of interesting people here. And I've heard comments from a number that are obviously veterans of World War II. Mm -hmm. I would enjoy a show of hands of the veterans of World War II. All the veterans. Hey. Glad to have you here. Let's go back to uh, Bud Lomel and uh, finish his. Why I wanted to take the mic back from Don, I was thinking of you older men. I'm not allowed to use the expression senior citizens in my house. My wife doesn't allow that. <laughs> However, in my summation, and I choose to call it that, I found a, a very moving essay on World War II by con uh, Colonel William Brown. What's that? The library announcement. Oh, I see. <laughs> I have to keep them off so it doesn't bother his sound. <laughs> anyway, uh, this was an essay, and I've taken some excerpts from this essay from uh, Colonel Brown that I thought particularly applied here. They walk a little slower these days, and the spring in their step is for the most part gone. Sometimes you have to speak louder when talking to them. Time has taken and is taking its toll on them. Their ranks grow thinner each day. They probably appear to you like any ordinary group of old people, mostly retirees now, sitting on a porch swing or in a rocking chair or wandering around the malls. They're ordinary parents and grandparents in all respects, save one. You see, America's World War II generation saved the world, not for glory, not for honor, not for lasting tributes on the printed page, but simply because it had to be done. No one else was available to do it. Yet isn't it ironically fitting that victory in the most intense, deadly, and important struggle in human history should seem so sort of uh, seem sort of ordinary to those who won it and to those who benefited the most from it. It isn't that the British or French or Chinese or Russians or any other freedom-loving people of the world didn't contribute mightily. They did. They suffered unutterably severe hardship, death and destruction. And that's precisely the point. With most of Europe in chains, Asia teetering on the edge of collapse, the Pacific in flames, and, an incredi and the incredibly brave British hanging on by their fingernails, it fell to the Americans to save the world from unspeakable horror of global fascist domination. We need to take a long, loving look at these elderly people of World War II generation now while we have the chance. If you know any, give them a hug and say thanks. No individuals or groups have ever matched their achievements. God willing, no one will ever again have to. Thank you for listening, and I'm...
I'm a, and if anyone wants to join me, I'm, a, I'm available for some hugs. <laughs> Well, why don't we um, all break now, if any of you would care to uh, visit the table at the back. Uh, we're looking for donations, and there are books you can check out, and there's some, I've taken the pictures of Point du Hoc and the rangers uh, covering the cliffs. Go back to the tables and take a look, or you can come up and uh, chat for a little. We've got to break up all of our equipment and be on our way. I'd just like to say, on behalf of everybody that's here tonight, that appreciates these men, or should, that we're all free because these guys made the sacrifice not only at D-Day, but throughout the entire war. And we're very lucky to have had these gentlemen and ladies to fight the fight that need to be fighted. And the rest of us who are of younger generations, uh, baby boomers and younger, uh, got to enjoy the freedoms that we have the last 50 to 55 years because of these gentlemen. and. Let it not go unrecognized. I'm glad that you fellas do this for us. <laughs>